So today we're talking about Fumilaya Ransom Kuti. And I remember hearing the name, you know, when I was in primary school, but I remember that all I was taught was that, you know, she was the first woman in Nigeria to drive a car. Now, is it that that, or they actually taught me what the business woman did, but I don't pay attention, but I don't think that was the case. I feel like I actually really paid attention in primary school, but that's neither here nor there. Who was Fumilaya Ransom Kuti? She was an aristocrat, an educator, a political campaigner, a women's rights activist, and one of those leaders who fought fiercely for Nigeria's independence in that time. A newspaper called the West African Pilot that was established by Nandi Azikwe was the first place where she was described as the lioness of Lesabi and the name stuck because she was friggin awesome. All right, so some brief basic facts about her early life. She was born Frances Abigail Olufumilayo Thomas on October 25th, 1900 in Abiokuta. And at the time, it wasn't common for families to invest in education for their daughters because, you know, they generally felt it was more important for boys. Well, her parents thought it was important, so they sent her to school. So after primary school, she went to Abiokuta Grammar School, and after that, she went to finishing school in Cheshire, England. Now, I didn't know what finishing school was, so I looked it up. Um, apparently, it's like just a school where they send, like, you know, elite, the daughters of the elite, so that they can learn how to, you know, become high class ladies. They can learn how to be proper ladies for their entrance into society. Basically, you know, they'll teach her to be to be drinking tea. I'm being asked like this, like that's just <laughs> that's basically what it is. It's just to teach you how to be rich and proper if you're a young lady as you enter into society, right? So she went to finishing school in England. But when she came back, something interesting had happened. She decided that she didn't want to be called Frances anymore. So basically she came back from England and she was like, listen. I don't want to hear Frances coming from anybody's mouth. Matter of fact, she decided that she preferred to speak Yoruba over English. So Frances was cancelled, English was cancelled. She was identifying a lot more with her culture, right? Now, it's believed that this change was in response to a lot of the racism she experienced while she was in England. And honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if that really was the case because I've seen this thing happen with a lot of JGBs. They would go to school in a different country and then develop this strong sense of Pan Africanism that wasn't really there before. That inferiority complex that, you know, being told Africa is why you're here and everybody else is amazing, all of that sort of gets like. The glass is just shattered and I've seen a lot of people be like, no, that's not the case. Like, our culture is not inferior to anything. Our culture is amazing. What? So that's highly life. Now, let's just dive into the things she did, back. Alright, so in 1944, she founded the Abiokuta Ladies Club, which eventually became known as Abiokuta Women's Union. And the organization defended the political, social, and economic rights of women. Now, this organization was a big deal. It became one of the most important and impressive women's movements of the 20th century, with an estimated membership of 20,000 people. So let's talk about Abiokuta Women's Union for a minute. Now, Ransom Kuti's first well-known political activity came when she led Awu in a protest against a special tax on market women. So basically, you know, in that time, there were taxes on things like income, water usage, stuff like that, right? But then the market women were being taxed especially, like on top of the normal taxes, they were taxed extra. Um, and, the tax and the taxes usually went to the market supervisors at that time. Market women who were probably mostly mothers, who were doing the most they could to feed themselves and feed their children and take care of their families, they are still taxing them extra. Hellfire is actually going to be hot for some people. So the traditional ruler of Abiyokuta at the time was Alake Ademola II, and he was helping the British to enforce colonial rule because we know that, you know, some local rulers helped the British to enforce colonial rule. But basically, he was the one in charge, so he was the one who had imposed these special taxes on market women. Now, of course, Ransom Kuti had appealed to the British to remove the Alake from power and stop that special tax on market women. But when that failed, she started circulating petitions and contacting newspapers. Now, in order to put more pressure on the authorities, Ransom Kuti and the women of Awu staged long videos in front of the Alake's palace, a public re they publicly refused to pay their taxes um, and they arranged for an audit of the sole native authority system and they demanded more representation of women on the SNA's executive council. Basically so that women would be part of the ones making decisions about the lives of women. And so naturally the authorities at the time did what authorities tend to do when marginalized groups of people start asking for basic human rights. They pushed back instead of giving them the basic human rights they were asking for. The Abiyokuta authorities started denying women you know, permits to do protests, um, started forbidding them from hosting parades and protests and vigils and things like that. And so Ransom Kuti and the women were like, cool, 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 cool. 
keep your permits we don't need it um well you people we're not doing protests again what we're doing from now on is we're doing picnic but <laughs> and so they started hosting picnics to protest basically what the like that we're doing and festivals right basically they were still protesting but they were just calling it something different since everybody wants to act like they are mad we can show you that we have madness too bad and these picnics that they were holding started drawing crowds of up to ten thousand people lots of demonstrators and just people coming in to participate and stand with the women right now of course the police would show up to these events and there would be altercations and they would arrest people and stuff like that and the police actually started tear gassing the people to break up the picnics and festivals right but for Milaya being the G that she was trained the women on how to deal with tear gas you know and use the membership fees they got from AWU to fund legal representation for the people who had gotten arrested I don't know if any of this is sounding familiar to what the things are happening now hashtag black lives matter now, as you can imagine, tensions were rising between the authorities at the time and, you know, the Abeokuta Women's Union. Um, and I'm sure that the Alakia at the time was just like, I can't, I can't, I can't, I, I can't with these women. That kilo, kilo day, are you remember the first ones to be oppressed? What is it? Re yeah. Small oppression, they're shouting. And I just can't, like, I have a warrior spirit, you know, it's been a hand here, and I just can't anymore. Apparently, he actually compared the Awu women to vipers that could not be tamed and banned Ransom Kuti for entering the palace for political meetings and stuff like that. Now, immediately this happened, the Awu women blocked the palace doors and decided that nobody's living anywhere today. You know, the British district officer that was visiting, they say it's not going anywhere, you know? Now, apparently, this whole incident ended with, you know, Ransom Kuti grabbing hold of the wheel of the district officer's car and decided that he's not going anywhere you know um, and would not let go of it until they pried her loose from it now when i read this it instantly took me back to my first year of university because i specifically remember you know i had a paper to write and i was you know i was writing about fela kuti right and i remember being in first year and reading that he was arrested over 200 times in his life for his fierce political activism and criticism of the nigerian government right um and i just i remember wondering like what kind of resolve does a person have to have that they jail you 200 times and it doesn't deter you from your fierce stand on the thing that you believe in the thing that you believe is right right like i i just remember being baffled and i couldn't get it at the time but then reading up about Fumilaya ransom kuti who was his mom i don't think i mentioned that by the way if you didn't know like Fumilaya ransom kuti was fela kuti's mother right but reading up about Fumilayo's life and just an incident like this and all the things she did and the fire this woman had in her belly it's making a lot more sense to me now where that same fire we see in Fela came from now public sympathy grew in support of the women right and they continue to protest the tax you know um and I don't think I mentioned that Shai, like I know I mentioned that this was a tax on women but it was a tax on only women like you know other men who had rec who had jobs and all that this tax they not put it on them it was just like there were no more taxes back and then there was a special tax on the abiyokota market they just don't tax them extra for just just because just cause you know so they continue to protest the tax with petitions and press conferences and letters to newspapers and demonstrations basically these women were not relenting in the things they were asking for now this is the to god be the glory part of the story right i will eventually got the colonial government to drop the tax on the women you know and also appointed a special committee to look into the complaints of the women and they made sure that they got women on that committee to make sure that their best interests were being represented and i will also make the alake abdicate the throne like trick buster for these women now newspapers across the country you know published you know what had happened about the events and ransom kuti's name like and her work you know became more widely known and all of this was before independence now speaking of independence Fumilaya also played a very important role in politics and in the pre-independence negotiations of 1946 now she soon became associated with some of the most important anti-colonial educational movements in nigeria and west africa she fought tirelessly to further women's access to education and political representation and social services health care and just Basically, she was she was passionate about eradicating these things that were sources and causes of poverty, right? Especially for women. Now, speeding up in the story because as I'm sure you can see, we're running out of time. In 1977, about a thousand soldiers stormed her family's property in Lagos, Fela's home, where she was living, 
and dragged her by the hair and threw her from the second floor and she died later on eventually from complications resulting from that injury can you imagine that was a terrible terrible thing to do to a woman who had done so much for our country i mentioned earlier that she was an educator a woman's right activist a strong fierce political campaign especially for nigeria's independence but she also was so much more that i cannot you know i'm sure i do not know about and i'm sure that i cannot include in this video for the sake of time she raised strong children who were unafraid to speak their mind and unafraid to stand stand up for what they believed was right her children would all go on to play important roles in music in medicine in arts in just she was an incredible incredible phenomenal woman and so when i learned all of this it baffled me that all i remember being taught in school about this woman in primary school was that she was the first woman in nigeria to drive a car and like her name should be there when you talk about our leaders you know who fought for independence Nandi Azikiwe, Tafawa Balewa, all these great people who made our country what it is she is one of those great people so now the obvious question is why is it that our people don't talk about our female heroes as much as we should why is it that they seem to be conveniently left out of history not just our people in general history in general right so as always nobody asked but i'll tell you what i think the simple obvious answer is she was a woman and nigeria is a very patriarchal society and i think that's a big problem because it is not inconsequential when women are conveniently left out of history i think it does something to the next generation right because think about it so in primary school you know we're taught like i mentioned tafawa balewa nambia sikwe murtala mohammed and all these amazing people who did incredible things and i'm glad that they teach us about these men right but when they don't teach us about the women who alongside them are fighting in the harshest of circumstances, what it does is that we limit the ability of girls to see themselves in our leaders. So boys can look at Nambi Azikwe, Murtala Mohammed, and all these people and know that that kind of greatness is attainable for them. When we talk about our heroes, our leaders, we don't really include women in there in the way that we should. Not because there's a shortage of female heroes to include, but because of maybe the minds of the people who are telling the stories that have been told so far. So when we leave our female heroes out of our history, we do a great disservice to our girls because we're not allowing them to aspire to greatness in the same way that we're allowing our boys to do so. So yes, you know, her name and her story and the incredible things she did are not necessarily included in our country's history in the way they should have because you know she was a woman in the 1900s in nigeria a very very patriarchal society right and patriarchal societies have not always taken so kindly to strong-willed and outspoken women and so the stories of women like this have been left out of our country's history but when i have done some in the future and i mean like way in the future way <laughs> i want them to know that just like my mother there were incredible women like Fumilaya Ransom Kuti, the lioness of Misabi, who did the most amazing things in the harshest of circumstances. I want them to see that that greatness is attainable for them. I want them to see that women can do and be anything in the same way that I want my boys to know that they can do and be anything. I think it's important. But as always, you know, there's a lot that I left out. My personal opinions have also informed how I have presented this story to you today. So I will leave everything in the description, all the links I use for my research, everything's going to be in the description. In case you want to do some light nighttime readings, you can read it all, right? But I do have a question. Do you remember being taught any of this stuff about Formula Iran and Kuti that she was involved in the fight for independence or Abiyokuta Women's Union or just all this kind of stuff? Was this taught in your school? Again, I don't think that the problem is that I just didn't pay attention in primary school. I really feel like I, I know that I did. But let me know what was taught to you, you know, with regards to her. Let's have a conversation in the comments as always. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe. Don't be a fish. And I will see you in the next video. Maybe I'll try and film in the daylight that time. I don't know you guys. I don't know why I keep filming at night. I am not a witch. Oh my goodness. Anyway, thank you for watching. I'll see you next video.